Welcome to another episode of We Don't Die. I'm your host, Sandra Champlain, author of the international best-selling book called We Don't Die, A Skeptic's Discovery of Life After Death. And just a reminder, our home base is wedontdie.com, where you can always find classes. We've got our free Sunday gathering with medium demonstration that happens every Sunday for four years now at 2 p.m. New York time. I've also just recently started a Patreon community. So if you're somebody who appreciates and enjoys my work and you wish to do a little donation, no pressure, but I have a list of over 550 hours of my combined episodes on both my shows. You get early bird access and you can search for everything. So you can find everything and more of what's coming up at wedontdie.com. Two episodes ago, you may remember, I interviewed the wonderful Bob Ginsburg, the co-founder of the organization Forever Family Foundation. Today, we get to talk to the president of that organization, who's done so much more. Lloyd Auerbach is a parapsychologist who has been in the field for over 40 years, focusing on education and field investigation. He's the author or co-author of 10 nonfiction books and one novel and teaches online parapsychology courses through the Rhine Education Center. His media appearances are massive, and he's probably one of the most respected authorities in the world when it comes to understanding the paranormal and parapsychology. Besides being a parapsychologist, he's a professional mentalist, psychic entertainer. This is nice. It goes by Professor Paranormal. And he's a public speaking and media skills coach and a chocolatier. So there's all kinds of great things to discover about him. You can visit the sites foreverfamilyfoundation.org and rhine.org, spelled R-H-I-N-E.org. I'm sure you will agree that Lloyd will fit it right in quite nicely with our community. Lloyd, welcome to We Don't Die Radio. Thanks very much, Sandra. Nice to be here. Oh, it's nice to have you. Yes, I just mentioned just before we started recording that I watched a bit of you on the internet on YouTube and it was quite, just quite refreshing hearing you talk. So I feel like you are a bird of the feather, so to speak. And um, yeah, you'd fit right in with this show. So a little bit about you. You are on West Coast America, right? Right, I live outside of San Francisco. Outside of San Francisco, always nice. Tell us a little bit about you and how you got into this wild and wonderful world. Well, um, yeah, I mean, it really goes back to an interest as a kid, it has nothing to do with psychic experiences at all. Um, has everything to do with having been a little science geek, but also interested in folklore and mythology and uh, really growing up in a TV family. I, I started watching shows like The Twilight Zone and One Step Beyond probably when I was around three or four years old. Had a TV in my room when I was two because my dad worked for NBC. And between that, learning to read really early, my mother was a preschool was a, a preschool teacher, and I just started reading comic books and science fiction. And the, and I was very heavily interested in in science. Um, my dad was actually involved in covering the Mercury and Gemini space shots uh, that happened too. So then I discovered uh, that there was an actual science of parapsychology. And that happened because I was watching a TV show called Dark Shadows. Um, and one of the characters talked about parapsychology in relation to psychic stuff. So I went to the library and I found these great books, probably about 12 or 13, um, on the science of parapsychology, which studied everything from ESP to life after death uh, and got fascinated by all that. I've always, always been interested in ghost stories anyway. Um, there was an old show called Topper, which I watched pr probably from the very beginning. Uh, you can actually find some episodes on uh, YouTube and the Internet Archive as well. Uh, but my experience with ghostly things and any of this comes from comedy, drama and science fiction, not from horror, which is what most of the ghost hunters tend to yeah. seem to start with. Um, so I really had that. And then I had a par I was able to start a parapsychology club in high school. Um, I grew up outside of New York City in, in Westchester County. And um, there were a couple of local parapsychologists or New York parapsychologists in the area that one of my neighbors knew. Um, she was a yoga teacher and introduced me to Montague Ullman, who had done a lot of work um, on dream telepathy. 
And then he introduced me to Gertrude Schmeidler, who had done a lot of laboratory work on ESP and, and also done a lot of haunting investigations. So I was very fortunate in my teenage years. And time-wise was even more fortunate that when I, um, I had intended to become a parapsychologist and there really wasn't anything specific until I got into college. And then in my senior year, found out that there had just been a new graduate parapsychology program started out in California. So uh, my graduate studies took me to, from um, New York area to California to get a master's in parapsychology and kind of the rest is history. So. That's amazing. So what would a definition of parapsychology be besides Par like yeah. psychic stuff? Of yeah, it, it is. I mean, it really is psychic stuff. So um, parapsychology is the study of what we call psychic phenomena or psychic ability, psychic experiences, which cover extrasensory perception or really it's not a sixth sense. This is, this is uh, something that pop culture kind of created in many respects. It's perception, but it's not sensory. So our normal senses give us information and we percolate this in our heads and we get a picture of the world and we figure out what the world looks like and sounds like. ESP adds information to that on top of it. So it's non-sensory perception that includes things like clairvoyance and telepathy and precognition. And then there is psychokinesis, which is our term for anything where the mind or consciousness directly affects matter and energy. So everything from psychic healing to moving objects to metal bending to affecting electronics, that's all, even, even moving our own bodies technically psych psychokinesis or PK. And then there's the third area, which is kind of what kickstarted the whole field as psychical research back in the late 1800s. And that is survival of bodily death, that consciousness that, our, that the human personality can survive the death of the body and interact, communicate all of that. And that covers the gamut from ghosts or apparitions to, of course, spirit communication with mediums to reincarnation and out-of-body experiences, near-death experiences. All of that is included in what we cover. Uh, we don't cover things like UFOs and some of the other stuff that's been connected by the pop culture. To We don't deal with Bigfoot. And I guess if we had a ghost of Bigfoot, we might deal with Bigfoot, but generally not. Um, so, and, and we have a, it's a laboratory study, but also a field study. Uh, so there's in, in, in the lab and outside the lab and the two cannot exist really without the other. So they exist with, with each other. Yeah. I always say to people, cause I, I have my own beliefs, so I don't need to push them on anybody, but if something empowers you to live a good life here, by all means, follow it. Um, but some of the things that are on television i really believe they're just to get more viewers on television oh, yeah. uh because yeah. you know personally i've never seen a bigfoot in any of the bigfoot shows <laughs> well, right, right. And, and you know the ghost hunting shows themselves are um that this is something i'm always constantly having to fight against these ideas that come from these tv shows including with the three thousand plus ghost hunting groups in the united states that model themselves, most of them, not all of them, thankfully, but most of them model themselves on what they see on these paranormal shows and their methods depend and what they conclude is dependent on which show they follow, which show they watch. So, uh, and all of that is developed, you know, has a little spark of what we've done for over a century in our field, right. but most of it is television related. You know, just the very fact that they investigate in the dark makes literally no sense given that ghosts are, you know, apparitions are seen throughout the day when the lights are on, you know, any time of day and night, it's pretty actually pretty rare for a ghost to wake somebody up in the middle of the night when it's dark. Um, so, and then of course, most people have experiences with the spirits or ghosts of deceased loved ones at the moment of death or within a couple of days before they move on to the other side. So it's really, you know, what they're doing on TV is just a far bit of far field from what we do. And it also, um, it's about ratings. I mean, they have devices that have great sounds and, and bells and whistles and lights because that's what producers have wanted all along, which we don't have. You know, they've wanted that since Ghostbusters came out. Right, right. Oh, we've got a lot to thank Ghostbusters for because I know Dan Aykroyd and Peter Aykroyd and I've got the book and... Yeah, I mean, I, my first book probably wouldn't have happened uh, without Ghostbusters. So, so <laughs> it, the thing is that Ghostbusters gave 
the media at the time, first of all, there, there wasn't night shot cameras, so they couldn't do anything in the dark, which was good. They still, you know, all the TV stuff I did in the, in the 80s, <clears throat> the directors still wanted us to turn the lights out, you know, still do the scene at night because they have to make it spooky for Halloween. You know, thankfully, the camera guy always pointed out, well, you know, the TV is a visual medium. We can't show anything if it's dark. Um, but Ghostbusters led media people, especially news people, news reporters, to say, and this is this is something that happened to me constantly, we know it's not like that. What's it really like? Right. And that's the question I wish modern folks would ask. I like it. I like it a lot. I remember uh, taking a weekend course with Tom and Lisa Butler from the a trans C now, but it used to be called the AAEVP. Right. And they had been behind the scenes to the movie White Noise, you know, and they were just sharing their experiments and what they did with EVP, saying messages that come through are of love and, you know, funny sometimes. And of course, a horror movie gets made. And on one hand, you know, people were freaked out thinking, oh my God, you know, these crazy messages can come through. But what they said is they got so many people interested in EVP that just started researching it. Right. And, you know, some with results, some without, you know, I've got my own stories of good results. And um, so sometimes the media can point in the direction that there's something there, but it might right. not be what you right. see it on TV right. or in the movies. Yeah, I mean, the reality shows, as, as bad as they are, in some respects, they have brought people out of the woodwork, um, made their interests okay to talk about and to do something about. Mm -hmm. That's been a good thing. On the downside, people have experiences, and if they've been watching those shows, they misinterpret their experiences based on the shows that they've watched. So we get people saying something about, you know, I think there's a demon in my house, when in fact, it's like you know, a raccoon scuttling around the attic or something like that. Yes. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So we're like-minded on that for sure. But I do think we are as human beings, and I think you can agree, pretty incredible. You know, I, yeah, I've, I grew up with a very skeptical mind and, you know, we had a local medium live in our town and nothing she said ever came true. And she'd make psychic predictions and nothing came true. So I think my parents just said, kids, you know, none of that's real. So I grew up believing that. So thankfully, I mean, I wasn't happy at the time, but I went through a huge fear of dying that had me looking for, for answers, you know, um, but I was skeptical. And I think we all have that voice of skepticism. And I think that's a good thing. It, it yeah. absolutely is. Yeah. Um, but, you know, when we think of down to the quantum level, if we want to look there, you know, all we are is vibrating energy, living on a planet, hurling around a never ending universe like there's some good stuff out there and i think well, we well and we're made out we're powerful. made out of the matter we're made out of the matter of stars that exploded a long time ago um you know uh, it's there's actually a couple of physicists there's several physicists who actually go below and they think they have a theory about the the substrate of the universe you know below the quantum level that everything is made up of information that Ooh. that smallest that's the smallest thing in the universe which means that you know which is leads them to say that there's information all around us and uh you know there are many different ways to look at at things for me uh growing up because i came from reading science fiction and comic books esp all of the psychic stuff everything from life after death to esp and psychokinesis indicated to me that human beings were limiting ourselves that we have potential mm -hmm. and we're not living up to our potential I mean, maybe after we die, we live up to our potential, but when we're in the body, we're, we are constantly restricting ourselves with things. Yeah, I think there's so much more, and I think we can access some of that. I, yeah. I remember meeting Russell Targ and doing remote viewing experiments and stuff, and I blew my mind some of the stuff that I knew yeah. and drawings I did and things he had in a you know sealed bag and that whole world i think really just opened me up to if that's possible what else is possible yeah i, I co-authored a book uh one of those books that i co-authored is called esp wars east and west and it's about the government psychic spying program um the, the main author was uh is ed may who was the program director <clears throat> from 1985 to 1995 when the program closed and we have joe mcmonagle who was one of the viewers involved but we also have uh, part of the book is from the Russians as well, talking about their successes and their failures. And 
uh, how much, you know, how much is actually did actually come true and how much our government folks, you know, I know this, the so-called skeptics, I, we like to call them pseudo skeptics, kind of poo poo everything from the government program from the Stargate program. But the reality is, I think it was, I think Ed said it was 17 out of 21 government agencies continually came back to them for more remote viewing. So, you know, it's like you don't go to a plumber or you don't call call an electrician more than once if they didn't do well, right? You go back to the same people over and over again if they've done right by you. So there's uh, that alone is enough of a statistic to say there's something to it. That's there is. beyond the data. Yeah. And I always encourage people to have your own experiences. If there's something that we talk about on the show or, you know, go after it because as great as our stories can be, it's once, you know, you have these aha moments yourself, like how, how did that happen? You know, those experiences really help you believe that there's more to you than meets the eye. Yeah. And I've been around psychics and mediums and other people since even before I got into graduate school. Um, talked to a lot of them, had a lot, and I've had a lot of experiences after I got into grad school, actually. But what's really interesting is there are ways that people can actually bring some of this ability. That there, it, it's a talent. I think it's an aptitude. Uh, Joe McMonagle actually talked about the, the aptitude for how much remote viewing you can do or how good you can get. Um, and I think it's, it's kind of like musical talent and artistic talent. Not everybody can do exactly the same thing. Some people can sculpt, other people can paint well. Other people have other artistic aptitudes and it's the same thing with psychic ability, which is why not every psychic is a medium, but every medium is a psychic. So it, it kind of varies quite a bit. And one of the courses I teach once a year for the Ryan Center is on developing that side of you, developing your intuition and ESP. And there, it, it doesn't take much to really do something to get you get going ab above where you are and even recognizing where you are, but you also have to recognize that you're not gonna be good at everything. Right, what are some of the basics? I mean, I know that's a whole course, but I, you know, is it meditation? Is it intention? So, so uh, yeah. I'll tell you the answer. This is what I tell my students all the time. I worked at the, at the American Society for Psychical Research in the early eighties, right out of grad school in New York. And uh, we were doing a lot of work with a psychic medium by the name of Alex Tanis. Mostly, most of our research there was on out-of-body experience because Alex could do that at will. And um, I, I had Alex speak in some of my classes. I got to know him really well. And I, one day I actually asked him, so Alex, what's the, what's the best way to get started being more psychic? And he just looked at me very seriously, say, said, notice you already are. And then what he did was he gave me an exercise, which is what I tell everybody. It's sort of meditative. In fact, if you're not into meditation, this is a cool way to start. And that is... Focus on your normal senses first. So spend a few minutes every day, uh, and you don't have to do this forever, but focus for three or four, three to five minutes, spend a few minutes in a room or someplace that has stuff or has a lot of, it shouldn't be a, like a white room. You wanna be in a place that you can look around and visually notice everything. You may even notice things in your own house by doing this slowly but surely looking around that you never noticed before then stop and listen, spend a few minutes listening. And you know, if you have any traffic outside, you'll hear the traffic outside. If there are animals around, you'll hear them. You might hear other people in your house. You might hear neighbors. You might hear your, the sound of your own heartbeat, certainly moving around in the chair. Focus then on your sense of touch. And I have to say, um, we always have to remind people that our skin, which is where our touch sense is, is our biggest sensory organ. So it's not just touching with your fingers. It is, okay, right now I'm wearing clothing. How does the clothes, how do the clothes feel against my skin? How does my watch band feel on my, my hand, my glasses on my face, my butt in the chair, things like that. And then you can actually have things like um, some, some things to smell either foods or spices, spend a couple of minutes exercising your sense of smell and even your sense of taste. And after a couple of weeks of doing this, just a, and it maybe takes about 20 minutes a day, you might notice that there's extra visuals. There's something visual that you're not seeing with your eye, but you, you get a good visual of it, or you're hearing, you think you're hearing something and it's pretty clearly not a sound, or you're smelling something and it's pretty clearly not the things you're smelling. That's what's coming through psychically. That's neat. I have not ever heard it explained that way. 
Yeah. Once you start noticing that, you know, you recognize that anything's coming through, it starts falling into place. Yeah. Which makes me think there's so many people that, oh, they want to get a sign from their loved one. And it's like, I think it just as being human, we're so caught up in thinking and not being in the present yeah. moment that there could be things happening all the time or just you know, gentle sensations and things. But next thing you know, there's a text that comes through and we're busy on our phone and, you know, what could be happening and we just have no idea because we are not. Well, yeah, I mean, especially in today's world where we're bombarded with so much um, constantly, just constant information and constant attention grabbing things, you know, people texting and uh, sending us Facebook messages and doing everything. I mean, I, I, I stay away from some of this. I, I'm not as active on social media as, as people want me to be. It's just because um, I just don't have time. That's I don't want much. Or the mental energy to do that. Yeah. yeah. And it can be draining, you know, it's just like, you know, love my mom who's upstairs and she's got the news on all the time. And so whatever you put in there, and of course, news can be quite negative. Yeah, well, news mostly is negative. That's yeah, that, yeah. yeah that's, there's no good news network, is there? Really? No. <laughs> yeah. So I know, I know it's been tried, but it has never, you know, never really worked. Um, no high ratings. No. Right. I don't know what it is about people that like to see the. Negative. Yeah, I think the closest it comes is comedy news, and that's you know, so. Yeah. So tell us a bit about the psychic stuff that started happening, and maybe mediumship and how well your beliefs in the afterlife how that all sure all um experiences so i i think that probably the first i started having some psychic perceptions on some of my cases when i when i was in grad school picking up things about what was not necessarily spirits but picking up things that were in the in the place itself um that were and i wasn't telling anybody about them initially uh the people i was the other students i was working with at the time um uh, but they proved out. I mean, people would then say things to me. The witnesses would say some stuff in our interviews. It's like, okay, I, I, I figured, pick that up. That was pretty interesting. Uh, when I was working at the ASPR and spending a lot of time with Alex Tanis, um, he, even though I didn't do this exercise myself right away, uh, I did pay attention if things were going on. And I think the very first things, kind of major things that happened to me were a couple of out-of-body experiences that happened spontaneously, one from a dream and one when I was really, really in a situation where I was really bored. Uh, and in those experiences, I <clears throat> had this out-of-body experience where I went to visit a friend of mine who was one of my adult ed students who was a psychic herself. And her daughter who was uh, in experience saw me, they both saw me, she and her daughter saw me the first time. This is when I was dreaming. I woke up from a dream in the morning and didn't think anything of it, that I'd gone to their house, um, talked to them while they were up late at night watching a, a late night movie. And a couple of days later, she called me and said, hey, were you ever gonna call me to talk about that dream you had where you came here because we saw you? Um, one of the things that, that we look at in, when it comes to ghosts or apparitions as we call them is that there's a whole category called apparitions of the living when people are seen as ghosts when they're out of body. A couple of weeks later, I was in a situation where I was extremely bored and I suddenly felt myself in two places at once. Um, fe felt like I was where, where at my friend's apartment, but also at this psychic's um, living room. She looks up from her, her book that she's reading. We started talking and at the end of the short conversation, I said, take some notes. And uh, I did that when I felt myself back in my friend's place. I found some paper and wrote, took notes. And the next morning I called her and out of her mouth, before she even said hi, I, I just said, hey, hey, Danita, it's Lloyd. She said, did you take notes? And we compared notes and again, she saw me. Um, so it was a very real and very impactful experience for me. And it was the those are the only out-of-body experiences I've ever had. But that indicated to me from an experiential perspective, uh, even though I, I had seen the evidence from studies that people could split. They could send off part of their consciousness, at least to other places, and they could be perceived by people uh, in some ways. And then over time, um, I had a number, I had a, some PK, some psychokinesis experiences and a few other psychic dreams. And eventually when I came back out to California to, to work in the graduate parapsychology program, um, after Ghostbusters, you know, we were, we were doing a lot of investigations because I, I and the, the department had gotten a lot of publicity 
because of Ghostbusters. And I had a case where, to me, the only possible explanation that made sense was that there was a conscious entity, an apparition, a ghost, a spirit in their in this family's house. Um, we were brought into the to the case by the mother who had just discovered that earlier that day that her son, who was 13, was having a daily conversation with the ghost that they'd all independently seen but not talked about from the time they moved in a year and a half before. Uh, and in our investigation, our, our interview with the witness, with uh, the family and all that, there was so much information about this woman, that her the previous owner's family, family stories. I had to talk to, find and talk to her only living relative who was in an assisted living facility to confirm the family stories. And she, he confirmed them all. And then there were some other elements that kind of popped up where it meant either, literally either this kid had found significant diaries and journals from this woman's entire life, which was not possible um, given the circumstances and memorized them. Uh, or he was like incredibly psychic, which there was no indication of whatsoever. Um, or they had Lois, the ghost, hanging around. God bless Lois. Wow. Yeah. So it really kind of, that cemented my belief in, in the afterlife, even though I, you know, I talked to mediums and psychics before and I'd seen some really good evidence from them, but that, you know, was just simply a head scratcher that just didn't fit anything else. And since then I've had a whole bunch of others too. Yeah. Have you had your own medium experiences? Um, not mediumistic per se. Um, I have, uh, I've certainly had, because, you know, one of the things that I know the mediums often make a distinction between those those ghosts or apparitions, we call them, who have not transitioned, <clears throat> calling them spirit, and then ghosts are here or apparitions are here. And actually, all the investigations we do are involved, when, when we're talking about a conscious entity, these are people who have not, definitely not gone over to the other side yet. In fact, some of them are either afraid or, or in some of our cases, we heard they didn't see the lights, so they didn't know where to go or how to transition. So we help them, those folks. Some of them just want to stick around and party. <clears throat> um, but uh, I, I've had experiences with those kinds of spirits, the ones who are still here, uh, including having been walked through a bunch of times by one of them who was like teasing me quite a bit at one of my long-term uh, investigations and um, hearing a voice and, and smelling a smell associated with a, with a, a couple of different spirits, that kind of thing. Now, how do you differentiate that that was earthbound or whatever you want to call it to you having mediumistic abilities that you're still picking up on? Well, I mean, to me, mediumistic ability is communication with the other side. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, although that, you know, that I think that everybody has, you know, everybody has some form of psychic ability. And if you have, technically an apparition that really, really wants to push it and communicate with someone or interact, they can kind of force the issue to some extent, kind of activate people's abilities. But people perceive things differently. I've never seen a ghost. I mean, I've never seen something. I've heard, I've smelled, I've felt. But I've never, and, I, and I take that to relate to my own perceptual process and how I process information. Um, I have some ideas about why that might be for me. Um, but it seems that in those circumstances, that's how I'm sensitive in some respects. I, I don't, because they're not really communication, you know, it's like minimal indications and, and perceptions. I don't consider that mediumistic per se. I mean, it's sort of a mediumistic experience, but it's not, I, I would never be considered a medium in that way. Well, you, you never know, know. you never well, know. I, I, know <laughs> I understand that. I understand that. But, you know, for us, a person has psychic experiences and abilities that does not make them a psychic. Just right. like, just like I can sculpt little things that doesn't make me an artist. Right. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. There's a whole world involved and I know mediums and I know through the uh, forever family foundation, yeah. you guys have certified them and everything. Um, I'm on kind of a, what's the word mission because there are, are so many people with that hang the title medium oh yeah and whether they are good or they think they're good or they have a big ego there's a lot of people out there 
charging a lot of money, claiming things. And, you know, I've had people come to me that have had some horrific readings. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And it, and it hurts. So I, it's like, I want to, like, my mom's cute. She always says, you know, what do you call the guy or gal that uh, graduates bottom of medical school? And the answer is doctor, right? <laughs> so just because they have the title doesn't mean that they're the be all and the end all. Uh, so maybe talk about mediums a little bit, because I know yeah, yeah. happens and psychically, I, some are really doing the real thing. Well, you know, what you're, what you're mentioning is, is really important. Uh, years ago, I had done a study <clears throat> looking not just at how good they were and information wise but kind of the qualities of the better mediums and psychics and let's take a, take ego for a minute you know um i've had a lot of psychics and mediums present themselves to me over the years who wanted to go on investigations with me and i'll test them out and there have been those and i've even kind of gone to, as a observer to watch other groups other you know ghost hunting groups and they have their group sensitive or medium and the divas or devos, mostly divas, um, who make it all about themselves are not good to work with. I mean, they may be getting good information, but if it's all about them, not about the clients, not about the situation, not about, and clients can include, by the way, the living and the dead, they're, they're useless, right? So there's that element to that. Um, I find that the better psychics and mediums tend to be very, mature, they, they have other interests besides the psychic world. They, you know, whether it's their family or something else that they do, they have a good sense of humor, especially about themselves. You know, I, I think that a big healthy ego is good as long as you know you have it and are willing to admit you have it and can kid about it. That's important for that. But then there's quality too. I mean, you do have to look at how good they are and what they're claiming. Um, over the years, I've heard so many psychics and, and other folks saying, I'm 95% accurate. To which I say, I usually ask them, really? How do you calculate that? And they have no answer to that. Um, if they're somebody who predicts things, they can't calculate that at all because if they predicted something 10 years in advance from their, their client, they can't go back and ask that client 10 years ago, later to see if they were accurate. What I do find sometimes is they have 95% customer satisfaction, which is what they should be saying instead of accuracy. That's an important, I mean, that's great. I mean, but we, we hear about that for, on other things, right? Products and things, you want that. Um, there are very well-known or have been very well-known mediums. There was one in particular psychic who called herself a medium after being just a psychic for many years. Um, who has written a lot of books. She died a few years ago. She was, if you saw her, see her on TV and she, her stuffs are still flying around, incredibly, incredibly mean to people. And yet, and she was charging, even back before she was famous here in the Bay Area, she was charging $800 an hour for a reading. And she, and, and we at the university got significant number of complaints about her because of her inaccuracy that which is nothing we couldn't ever do anything about that but the other thing we kept on trying to get people to go to the district attorney's office because her business practices were really bad in fact there was a little bait and switch happening where somebody would get there pay their money that she wanted cash back then this is before you know credit cards were sort of there but um we we got these complaints that people would go in pay their money sit around waiting like an hour later, uh, somebody comes out, the receptionist says, I'm sorry, she's too busy right now. Um, you could, we can either reschedule you in three months or you can see her husband or son, they're both psychics too, uh, for the same amount of money, by the way, and no refunds. They had just paid their money, I mean. And chances are they're grieving and they're desperate for information that that's they're correct. That's still correct. around. So, so they, would, they would either walk out where they'd see the other folks and wouldn't get a good reading anyway. And that's illegal. I mean, that whole practice is illegal, uh, but we could never get people, they're too embarrassed to complain to anybody about that. But when you have people, those kinds of situations, especially, I mean, frankly, the meanness that I would see on, P and what I heard from people and what I saw on TV for this woman um, was enough to tell me that it didn't matter how good she was why would you subject yourself to that especially if you're grieving you know why would you do that to yourself and unfortunately a lot of people do that 
Um, I'm, I'm also, you mentioned I was a mentalist, psychic entertainer, former magician. I mean, that was something I learned because I was looking as a researcher, I want to make sure I'm not dealing with phony psychics when I'm working with folks. And also it helps me in understanding how people make mistakes in their perceptions, you know, honest mistakes. But I've seen a lot of, of not fraud, but of people who think that they are psychic or who think that they are mediums who are sometimes getting good information from observing. They're really good observers. And honestly, some of them are better than some of the psychics I've seen. I mean, imagine if Sherlock Holmes had been pretending to be a psychic instead of a detective. That, I would have gone to that guy. <laughs> I mean, he would have told me a lot of good, a lot of stuff that was absolutely true. Maybe not about my future, but otherwise. Yeah, Penn and Teller have done, I remember seeing them do something that it was cold readings, but they're just yeah. trying to say, you know, anti-mediums. And then I think uh, Darren Brown, is that his name? Yeah, Darren uh, Brown's done a lot of that stuff. He's you done find... a lot of that stuff. And yeah. it makes you wonder just how, <clears throat> I know from my own personal experiences, because I've taken enough medium classes, even though I'm not a practicing medium, that, you know, the stuff is real, you know? Yeah. I know, because I've experienced it. Uh, but there's a lot of that stuff out there. And... Well, let me, let me give you an example. You know, a few year, number of years ago, Gary Schwartz, who um, really kind of kicked off with his mediumship work research, right. he really kicked off um, a lot of the research. Uh, John Edward, who'd been around for a while. And by the way, John Edward, a friend of mine who was an investigator, told me about John Edward before John Edward was ever known to anybody wow. because he had done a couple of investigations with this kid. He called him a kid. John Edward, who did amazingly well in a couple of investigations. So um, that was a really cool thing to find out to begin with. But Gary had asked and had flown in uh, at my suggestion. Uh, we all flew to LA. <clears throat> there was a, a group of us, um, my psychic entertainer buddies. I had several of the best cold reading people in the field of mentalism. I mean, the best readers, the most knowledgeable readers that were there. There was a skeptic that Gary wanted to bring in as well, who knew something about cold reading. Uh, and we watched video of some of the experiments that Gary had done beyond that initial HBO special that he did. Uh, and some of the stuff with, it was better and better and better controls to the point where um, the four guys that I had brought in said, yeah, that's not cold reading. He was either given information up front or or it's real. I mean, that's what they basically said. Now, there was another person who was incredibly knowledgeable who said, with enough time, I could probably duplicate that. Um, and I was, but, you know, and he was challenged by Gary to do that, but, you know, he was, Gary wasn't going to pay him to learn how to, to get that point. <clears throat> I doubted he could actually have done that. Yeah. But when you have the guys who are the best <clears throat> in the business, literally, and most knowledgeable saying, yeah, that, that's not what we do. That's, you either have to know, have to have that preloaded with that information, or you're being really psychic. You're communicating. Yeah. How about your involvement with Forever Family Foundation? How did that come about? I think I met Bob, Bob and Fran Ginsburg at um, a conference on the afterlife that um, the Rhine Center had actually put on at Duke University back, might have been 2005 or 2006, somewhere around there. And um, connect with, I was speaking at that conference on, on my apparitional, you know, the, the ghost hunting stuff that I was doing. And we, we kind of hit it off. And then they did a conference on the afterlife in San Francisco in 2008, which um, here, in, which Bob had asked me, Bob and Fran had asked me to kind of help with, and I spoke at, um, and that got me much more involved in, in the organization. And eventually when, uh, uh, we had a, a researcher who was actually retiring as president. Uh, they asked me to run for president, which I was glad to do the first time. And, you know, I don't do as much as certainly as Bob does uh, or as Fran, Fran used to do, or as much as Lee Harris does as the executive director, but I'm as involved as I possibly can in this, in this group. It's an amazing, amazing organization. The mediums I've met are some of the most down to earth, fun, fun people I know. Um, I have to say that one of the things that I've noticed about psychics versus mediums 
is I think because mediums deal with people living and dead, you know, they have social, better social skills than a lot of psychics do. That's fun. Um, so they're a lot of fun and they, and they fit these, all these criteria I talked about before. Um, I worked with an amazing medium for years until she passed away in 2011, Annette, Annette Martin. And she was, she actually came through after she died to one of our medium, medium panels in our board meeting, which surprised everybody because she wasn't a member of our, we have an auxiliary board that's deceased members or deceased uh, relatives of, of some of the board members. And Annette pushed her way through, which was pretty interesting in itself. So I've seen a lot of that kind of thing happen too. Oh, I love it. And have you been involved in any of the uh, certifying mediums or any of that line? Um, of only, I have not directly involved. You know, I've kind of gone through early on, um, I, you know, I helped look at the process and every once in a while I'll, I'll make suggestions. When we, um, when the pandemic happened, suspended any of the certifications and I really kind of pushed Bob to start them up again, but doing them virtually, which they've been doing to some extent before um, and kind of making a few modifications based on what I knew about zoom and and how this all all worked so um not so i'm not directly involved but i've kind of advised in a couple of instances for the yeah. for getting the folks certified and i'm also i've also been on the advisory board and helped out a little bit very little over the years with the windbridge research center which does the best um controlled research on mediumship yeah i haven't spoken to julie yet i know i've featured some of her quotes and things but julie <clears throat> Baishal has got some fantastic things. Um, so yeah, her research is among the the best controlled research in science. Yeah, I'd say, you know, it's like quadruple or quintuple blinded. Um, it, it's crazy. It's crazy how good it is. Yeah, yeah it's, it's so important. And you know, I talked to Bob in episode 406. This is 408 of this show. And he said, out of all the mediums that come to him, it's like 10 to 15% get certified. Right. Some of them not to their fault because they don't know they can be better. There is ego sometimes involved and well, they and don't want to continue training. Honestly, I got a good friend of mine who's tried a couple of times and she has a problem with, uh, if it was just by phone, she would be fine, but she has a problem with computers and she actually causes problems with the computers. <laughs> so she's, she's kind of a technophobe to some extent. So, um, she should have passed with, with flying college. She's one of the best mediums I know. She's actually one of the Winbridge certified research mediums, but um, she just can't do Zoom. She, she doesn't like looking at people when she's doing readings unless she's in person. Oh, can she turn and, off the yeah. picture? <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, I know I've suggested that. Oh, it's uh, a way. But, that, but apparently they, you know, that's, that's not what has no, to happen. That's true, that's true. Well, yeah. if it's meant to be, it'll be. It will, but I know people want evidence of the lab afterlife. They want to know their their loved ones yeah. are around. But there also needs to be understanding of grief. Uh, you know, I saw a very famous medium. I'm doing a stage presentation, and I was so excited because you know he's one of the current supposed best. There was no presence of love, or he was just shouting out information to people, shouting it out, shouting it out. And oh, I can take that. And then he sat down or, you know, it, but it, it, nobody in the audience felt like my loved ones would be around too. And there was just. Yeah, that, that's, that's, a, that's an important factor when you're dealing with people in grief. Um, because one, one of the things it does, unfortunately, is it means that maybe the people in the audience now are impressed that there's medium, if people are getting real information. So they'll seek out another medium and another medium. And this is what the this, this so-called skeptics really complain about is people will continue to spend money on all sorts of mediums because they can't accept that their loved one is dead and all of that. Well, it's, it's sometimes because the mediums are not connecting on that compassionate level uh, yeah. at all. Um, so it, it's really important. And I, what I see the, the group readings that we do at our grief retreats and even at some of the conferences we've done uh, when I've seen, when I saw Annette Martin do readings, I worked with a medium from Ireland who um, passed away a few years ago. She was made a, she did make it as a certified medium for us, Sandra O'Hara. She was a phenomenal medium and about as compassionate a person as you'd expect or, or could consider. And 
I, I think that that comes that needs to come across um, with the mediums, and it's something we make sure that our mediums are connected in that way. It's not part of the specific certification process because it doesn't come through in the testing. But right. when we see them or use or work with them otherwise, that needs to be there. We need to see that kind of compassion. And the sad thing is that, because um, I can think of a conference we had a couple of years ago where there was a woman there who um, could not get past her own grief because she felt partly responsible for the for a car accident in which her son died. And even though every one of the mediums very compassionately tried to help her through that and was getting, the sun was coming through through everybody with the same, like, it's not, it wasn't your fault. You know, you have to let it go. She could not let it go. <clears throat> and we, and everyone was saying, you know, you really need to see a therapist. There's a reason why you can't let this go. Your son is saying, let it go. He's given you, you know, forgiveness for this. Why can't you let, why? And she was going to continue to see other mediums until we don't know what her end point was going to be. Um, so people need to take the messages to heart, especially when they're delivered with love and really integrate that. And, you know, uh, some of the mediums say that sometimes the spirits are there for us until we are, you know, we're holding them here sometimes. We're holding them back because we can't let go of them. Yeah, I, I don't personally buy into that only because I know once I transition <laughs> that I can look back and know really how hard it was being a human being. Oh, of course, of course. Yeah. Yeah, I, it's brutal. It's absolutely brutal. And I think my beliefs are our loved ones continue growth in the uh, afterlife. And I believe that too. Um, yeah. But they're also just a breath away. It's not just, you know, three months from now when you go see a medium, you know, it's their part of our life and to, to keep them alive. Well, well, I think all the mediums I know um, talk about the fact that we can maybe not be mediums per se, but we can communicate or connect with our loved ones, the people that we know, you know, with, with the ESP research, we know very well that the, if you have an emotional connection with somebody, your communication via ESP, this is talking about the living is significantly better than if you don't have a connection with that person. So that's gonna continue after the other folks' death. It's gonna still be there. And know if you feel that somebody's around you, why not? You know, um, in certain parts of the world, there are ancestor spirits that are always around people and people, uh, that's their belief system. And it's not, you know, the skeptics will say, well, it's, that's a negative thing to believe. It's like, I don't know how that's negative, honestly. Um, you know, unless you are do, stopping yourself from doing something because you, you know, you don't want to harm your deceased relatives or something like that. Yeah. yeah. Everything, all the belief in this, and I think that's one of the things I really talk about in this show is to help people live a powerful life now to not get stopped in the grief because sometimes people die internally let alone you know suicides yeah. when yeah. they hit rock bottom but to let them know you know life is hard it definitely is but we still have their support we can work through grief it's a process absolutely it is but how to have a powerful life while we're here and you know when bad stuff happens and grief happens you know it can have us start looking at our own spirituality and what our beliefs are Yep. And I was one of those, I would laugh at people, to be honest with you, Lloyd, who would believe in the afterlife. I'm like, there's no evidence of that. Well, there was, and I never just took the time to research it, you know, so I feel like I'm a good messenger for this because I, I didn't believe in it. But mm -hmm. um, to help people live life powerfully and like you following your passions, which are so great and so varied and you know, how's your quality of life with these different passions? I mean, you do a lot of things. Well, you know, um, it's good. It's good. I, I have to have a day job because parapsychology doesn't pay enough. <laughs> right. <laughs> Unfortunately, uh, but I have a good day job. So, um, What's your day job? So I work for a company called LexisNexis, mm -hmm. which is an online, uh, le mainly legal information, legal news, financial stuff like that. And I, um, I work mainly with law librarians and large law firms. So information professionals, and I, that's like the group that I, I used to work also with lawyers way back when. I, I much prefer to work with librarians 
because um, you can see the number of books I have here. I have a ton. I'm a like a librarian here, so I love it. Um, it, it so it's it's a good job, and the company's been very supportive of me over the yeah. years, um, which is really really great. I actually do ghost story presentations for some of the law firms <laughs> from time to time, um, and some of the librarian groups. So it's. It, it's a it's a good it's a good living in that way. Um, the courses that I teach, you know, I I feel even though I'm often known in especially through the ghost hunting world as like a ghost hunter guy, um, I really am more of an educator and uh, generalist in the field. Uh, you know, not a lab researcher. I, I will say that I've consulted a laboratory. I don't like that kind of of work as much, but. Um, that is great. And now that the pandemic is hopefully over, I, I'm, I've just been rebuilding my mentalism act. Uh, I had to stop performing, of course, because of the pandemic. And uh, I'll be doing more of that. And I just made some chocolate for some friends the other day. So, you know, I love that. Yeah, I own a chocolate shop for 20 years. That's my retirement plan. Love it. Chocolate shop. Yeah. Oh, well, if you need any anything you know i've got okay. a chocolate mind i do i do i do um the mentalism act i've seen some mentalists that i swear to god they're the real deal that they're yeah. doing psychic things and i i don't want to give you know i'm not asking for any secrets of the trade um but do you tap into your own abilities a bit i would think you'd have to be a little bit so, well actually you don't have to i mean yeah. this is this is the interesting thing and um, I started out doing just magic. In fact, I, during the eighties, I was doing comedy magic, even at comedy clubs. Neat. And, uh, one of my mentors, Marcello Trizzi, who was actually a skeptic, but a very, very, you know, really the epitome of a true skeptic, you know, um, didn't disbelieve, didn't really believe, but he also supported, I mean, he Frank frequently supported the work of psychic detectives because as useful. So um, he just didn't think they were psychic. He just thought they had some other brain wiring or something. But he encouraged me to switch over to mentalism, which is more aligned with parapsychology in many respects. Um, and I dove into that world. There is so much in mentalism and psychic entertainment that even magicians don't know. In fact, we love fooling magicians. That's a fun thing to do. Um, and it, it's really, it's a lot of psychology, but it's a lot of things that you would never expect. Um, but in throughout that time, uh, I know um, there have been a number of surveys of members of the Psychic Entertainers Association and magicians and other folks. And what's interesting that comes out of mentalists is that they'll be doing their act and something will pop in their head and we can say it out loud. Doesn't matter if, you know, we think it's right or not. We just, you know, a string of numbers comes in our head. Somebody yells out, hey, that's my phone number. Or, you know, that's my driver's license number. Or, or a name pops up, just like happens with mediums, right? And we put it out there and somebody calls it out. Um, the audience assumes it's a trick. It's not a trick. It's just that when you're in the mindset of pretending to be a psychic or pretending that, it triggers something in you where stuff will flow in. And if you're willing to take the chance, you find often that it's correct. And if it's not, it's not a big deal because we know that ESP is not 100% accurate, right? Mm -hmm. One of the best things about being a mentalist is, unless you're bending stuff, bending metal, um, if you are doing the ESP type of stuff, you can be close. You don't have to be exact. You can miss. In fact, missing makes things look better for us. But if you're a magician and that trick doesn't work, you're a bad magician. It so sure, we have an advantage, yeah. It sure is fun to watch. And I don't, I, I love seeing mentalists. I do. I think it's just great. Yeah, I, I mean, some of the people in the Psychic Entertainers Association are among the best in the world. And uh, uh, it's, uh, it goes well beyond what magicians like Penn and Teller will do. And, you know, Darren Brown's a really good uh, performer. He does a lot more than just mentalism. Uh, but there are other folks like Mark Salem and, Gerard Senehy, and there's a whole bunch of guys who are just in our group that are are just phenomenal and always and really entertaining and connected to the audience in many ways. Yeah, well, I can I would think you'd be pretty good because just how your personality is and you're down to earth and you're fun and you're 
Well, you know, Professor I'm, Paranormal is not only my title, it's my disclaimer. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Tell us about the Rhine Education Center, rhine.org. Right. So rhine.org is, uh, that's the Rhine Research Center's main site. Uh, the Rhine Center is the legacy of the old Duke Parapsychology Laboratory, which was the first major parapsychology laboratory in the, ninth, in the uh, United States, started in the 1930s. Uh, shut down, the lab shut down in 1965 when J.B. Ryan, the founder, um, retired from Duke and he started, he moved it off campus and eventually it was, after his death, was renamed the Ryan Research Center. Um, about 2013 or 14, the executive director <clears throat> decided to start offering online classes and I worked with him to develop our curriculum, <clears throat> excuse me, a number of the various classes. He teaches some of the laboratory work. I teach a lot of uh, a lot of the others. We're bringing in other people to teach classes. Um, we've had remote viewing classes. I teach a class in developing ESP. Uh, besides my investigations classes, and I have a class on survival of bodily death and the evidence. Um, teach a number of those different things, and the classes are all online. They are reasonably priced. I have to say, based on what I see out there as well, they're either four week or eight week classes, and we have students taking them just for fun. So they participate as little or as much as they want. And we have a lot of students, usually about a third to a half of the students in each class take them for a grade or for credit towards a certificate because we have several certificate programs as well. And because the Rhine Center is recognized well um, by the Parapsychological Association, in fact, the Rhine Center publishes the official journal of the, of the field, um, folks who get a certificate in our, in our, from us, it may not be academic per se or a college, but it's recognized by people in the field and it's a, it's a good inroads if people wanna get into the field, regardless of, of what aspect of the field they wanna get into. So we have two classes coming up actually <clears throat> that I'm teaching. There's a bunch of classes, they're already up on the, the site. So if you go to rhine.org and, and either sign up for the mailing list or just click on the education link, it'll take you over to the education center. Our classes are starting the first week, or excuse me, um, I think the week of October 9th is when they're starting. And I'm teaching one class that people might be interested in, which is a paranormal case studies, looking at some of the best cases of things like apparitions and reincarnation. Uh, some of my own cases are gonna be there, we're gonna do deep dives into some of those as well. But there are some other classes might be of interest. There's an intro class being offered by one of our former students. It sounds great, because I love doing the show because people are looking for reasons <clears throat> to believe in the afterlife and that's great, but then what? You know, here we are. This right powerful soul like how are we going to exercise that you know you don't have to but you may want to so this is the first conversation i've had of this kind lloyd and i think there may be several people who may be interested and in just that's, exploring and what's possible that's that, what that, makes life fun yeah and, and you know the fact is that um i have students who or we have students who take like one or two classes we have a lot of classes throughout the year and I think the, hum the survival class, survival of body left, will be either winter or spring. So mm -hmm. I I'm sure that the people in this class will be very interested in that, but they might be interested in my case studies class as well. Um, the developing ESP or developing intuition class, the remote viewing, that's usually spring or summer next year. But, you know, there are practical classes. There's one that we just had on out-of-body experiences for people, how to do them and, and the research on that. So... Um, we have live lectures that are all recorded because we know not everybody can make the live lectures. Uh, I have students all over the world, so the time difference makes a difference sometimes. And again, people can participate in the forums, tons of information they can download. So it, it's it's a good value. Tons of videos on the website. Yeah. Tons. So that's rhine.org. Well, Lloyd, we're approaching the end of our time together. Is there anything I should have asked you and I didn't? Or is there any closing words well, you want to you know, share? There are many, many, many different things you could have asked me. I know, but you know, <laughs> um, follow, follow that instinct of yours uh, if there's anything left unsaid for this time. Yeah, I, I will say that if people are really, you know, this topic, this idea of evidence for life after death, there is a huge amount of evidence uh, and there are a number of books by my colleagues, you know, the, besides the more popular books that might be out there. Um, not that these, that these books are textbooks or even academic per se, uh, but there's a lot of resources that uh, people can actually access. Um, and one of the things you might start out with is watching the series Surviving Death on Netflix. <clears throat> Leslie Keen 
It's based on Leslie Keene's book, Surviving Death. Uh, she's a journalist who did a deep dive into the Forever Family Foundation and other things. Her book is very, very good. Um, I highly recommend it. I wrote a chapter actually in the book, but there's a lot of references in there, recommendations for other reading. And that's a good way to get into what else is there. Um, and then there's, you know, there's the Rhine Center. We, we'll, we'll point you to all sorts of stuff uh, through the Rhine Center. Well, I'm excited to explore it more. It's funny because I feel like I've been researching this stuff for over 25 years, but I haven't met you, you know, and now thankfully we have and uh, been introduced to the Rhine Center. So it's just like this um, spider's web that just connects and you just keep yeah. following it. And that's good advice for anyone just to get started. And whether it's your own soul leading the way, your own passion, or you're getting a little whisper from the unseen world, who knows? But this is the stuff that makes life fun and valuable and rich and, you know, not knocking, binge watching, just entertaining television shows, because I know there's time for that as well, but to be working with your own soul and your own interests. I mean, it, and you meet such great people, don't you? Lloyd, that are like-minded and friends yeah. for life. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I, I can say that about everybody I've met for the Forever Family Foundation. So um, I look forward to any of the events that we do together, even when sometimes when there are things like the grief retreat that's coming up. I mean, I, I look not not that the people coming are coming out of happiness. They're coming off often out of grief, but they always leave happy. I, that's the one really amazing thing from the grief retreats I've actually participated in is how much of a change there is uh, when people get a chance to either to to connect with the mediums, to connect with their loved ones, but also to hear the evidence, because that's one of the things we do at these grief retreats is really talk about the evidence for that life after death. And that's beautiful. I'm so grateful to talk to you today and talk to Bob a couple episodes ago. Just a reminder to everybody listening or viewing, foreverfamilyfoundation.org. You can join, you can become a member, and also rhine.org, and uh, so much more. And I know you've been featured on a lot of things on YouTube, and it's really fun talking to you, Lloyd. Thank you, thank you, thank you for your time being with us today. You're very welcome, Sandra. Just love it. And for our listener or our viewer, uh, thank you for being with us. There could be lots of things you could be doing right now, but you got to spend this hour with Lloyd and myself. As a reminder, you can find past episodes, medium classes, our free Sunday gathering, just tons of stuff, tons at wedontdie.com. If you scroll to the bottom of the page, it says, uh, if you want to join my email list, you can. It says you get the first few chapters of my book. Here's the secret. It's the entire book. Chapter 10 is how to survive grief. And it, it's really what's at the foundation of everything I do, helping people through grief, understand the reality of the afterlife, and then having a good life while we're here. So you'll find that within the pages. So in closing, my name is Sandra Champlain, always so happy to be your host on We Don't Die Radio. I do believe that life is an education for the soul and that our lives here on earth are important. So maybe it's from this episode, there's something you feel a little bit passionate about or you may want to explore. Do it. Act as if this is all real. It is. But you never know what forces can help you on your journey. You're certainly not alone and you are loved and you're special. You're one of a kind and you matter. So thank you for listening or for watching and we'll see you again soon.